Good morning. Um, I've been asked to spend uh, about 30 minutes uh, with the Bible open to try and set the context for the day. So it's a bit more monologue, but with a view to plenty of dialogue to follow throughout the day. I thought maybe before I, I look at Matthew 9 and 10 with you, I might just ask you to get on your feet and go to somebody from a slightly different diocese or a different diocese to yours. And maybe take a couple of minutes each to say, have you had an encouragement uh, recently in this area? Mission to sports women and sportsmen. Has there been an encouragement that you've experienced? Maybe there isn't and you need somebody else's encouragement for that. That's fine, isn't it? Of course. But could we do that for just a, a five or six minutes, three minutes each, if appropriate, and then I'll draw us back in and we look at Matthew 9 and 10 together. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, can I call you back in? Well, I, I, hope, I hope that's um, at least a taster of the reason we give a day up to come and think together with like-minded people about what we're trying to do. Uh, let's, let's open our Bibles to Matthew 9.35. <clears throat> and let me uh, try and walk us through uh, two halves to this in uh, the next period of time. I think first, you have Luke 10, you have Matthew 9 and 10. You have very comprehensive visions of mission from the Lord Jesus. And what's quite striking in the Matthew account is that um, Matthew 4.19, the gospel isn't, isn't structured around this per se, of course, but in Matthew 4.19, Jesus says to the disciples, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. The so-called Great Commission, you feel sorry for the other commissions because there are four commissions in the four gospels and you feel sorry that the others aren't called great. But the Great Commission of Matthew 28 is the climax of the gospel. Go and make disciples of all nations. So somewhere in there, he's captured what he's going to do with them, turn them into fishers of men. He captures the Great Commission for them and for us. And right in the middle, you almost have a training exercise for those people involved in sports clubs. If there's a game on Saturday, maybe on Thursday, uh, the coach will pull people aside and say, right, here's the shape of play for this weekend. Here's the pattern of play. You'll have to make decisions in the match on tactics, but we need a pattern of play. Jesus seems to give them a pattern of play in Matthew 10, principles by which mission will operate. And when the great day comes, when he's risen and the spirit comes and the church moves, we can read today this pattern of play in Matthew 10. Uh, my tactics won't be yours, but I hope a little overview of this will help us to at least have some frame of reference for discussion for the rest of the day. So let's dive in at Matthew. I'll read a bit as we go, as opposed to the whole text. Come with me. Uh, there's some headings on the screen. A man with a mission. Here we are in Matthew 9.35 with a, a typical stopping point in the Synoptic Gospels. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. There's Matthew saying, who is this man? And he's an incredible healer. He's a great teacher without a formal education. The great question of the first half of the Gospels, who is this? And he captures the story. He captures it in a sentence. Now, they didn't know, of course, at the time who he was. They weren't sure. That's the whole point. The disciples weren't sure. But, of course, he knew. And we now know. We know where he was going and who he was. He was heading for Jerusalem. He was heading for a cross. And we do have an insight in 36, not to who he was at this stage, but to what his motive for mission was. And it's wonderful. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I'm involved with Cambridge United. We played Portsmouth Saturday. Uh, we were optimistic of a result. We lost 1-0. Uh, and as I left the ground afterwards and, and left the where the players hung out and all that stuff and, and walked home. Uh, there's a crowd of people walking and I thought, gosh, I'm going to a conference in York with 40 or 50 of us. Here's a big crowd for us, 7,000, full house for us, that is, 7,000 people. Whoa, how do you view this missionally? What is the point of having a big infrastructure of conference when here are people 
involved in sport. And this verse comes strongly to mind. When the Lord Jesus sees the crowds, he does not get frightened. He does not see impossible. He's not triumphalistic, we see it, but he just sees this. He has compassionate eyes. It's a strong word in the gospel. It's only used of Jesus, actually, or by him. It's a broken heart word. He has tremendous compassion. Why? Because he sees harassed and helpless people, sheep without a shepherd. It's the image of Israel in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 34, no leader, mangled by the wolf, ripped apart. When God looks at my friends more, when he looks at me, he sees a man who without Christ has no hope, no leader. It really doesn't matter. I'm not cool or sophisticated or urbane or rich. But it doesn't matter if you are or if you're the woman or bloke lying on the street who needs a night shelter. doesn't matter who we are. He sees leaderless women and men ripped apart. And he has deep compassion. There is no mission without those lenses. There cannot be mission without those lenses. There cannot be. But of course, it's not intuitive to any of us to wear those lenses. It's counterintuitive because of our vanity. The wonderful thing here in this motivation for mission is that he is not depressed by the crowds. And it's beautifully unpacked in 37 and 38, which I've rather grandly called the theology of mission. Uh, it's too grand. Then Jesus saw, said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest then for to send workers into his harvest field. A passage which could take 30 minutes in its own right, obviously. Here's the thing I'll pick out uh, as we progress. We're just going to go through to about verse 15. Here's the great thing. It's his harvest field. I'm in Cambridge. <clears throat> I see the crowds. Uh, it's nice to come to a conference about sport and, and mission and ministry. Uh, but the reality is, I live in my little neighborhood with my sporty friends and young people and older people, and I look at them and I think, who are they again? I don't matter. They're leaderless. They have no Christ. They have no... You need, they need compassion, as do I. The Lord sees his harvest field. Now, for me, this is the great liberation of the mission of Jesus to sport amongst all things. It is not my harvest field. Oh, what a relief. Two things follow and it's my harvest field. Mostly depression. What a failure my mission is. You've got to be pretty unusual not to get depressed. Uh, living in the West today so easily, and forgive me for being so miserable about it, if it's my harvest field, my bang for my buck has not been great on my return in my lifetime. But if it's his harvest field, I can so afford to kick my vanity into touch. The number of men and women you meet as you get older who despair because one of their own children isn't converted. You might be in that number. And, and I think this scripture would say to us, hey, grow up. Stop beating yourself up. Stop it. Are you the Lord of the harvest? Are you the great master of it all? Calm yourself right down. I am the Lord of the harvest. What, you're whinging about your parish? I am the Lord of the harvest. Of course it's not binary. It doesn't mean that we are passive and we're kind of hyper-Calvinists. It doesn't mean that at all, but it does mean that the Lord is sovereign in mission. It's hard to understand we're on tiptoes with it. Church history is on tiptoes with it. But he is the Lord of the harvest. And it humbles us. Just as we are humbled by being leaderless, mangled women and men without Christ. And it also takes away this, this theology of mission, this sovereignty of God in mission. It also takes away vanity in the form of pride. Well, of course, um, my church is fine. Thank you very much. We're going very nicely indeed. Yes, my home's fine. Thank you very much. We're going nicely indeed. Oh, we've got a very nice little sports ministry going on. It's fine. Thin lines vanity into despair or pride. 
eschew them all. Put these grasses on. He is the Lord of the harvest. He is the creator of the universe. He sees the mangled wrecks. He intervenes. He has a plan. So when we think sports ministry, we must get our theology straight. We are where we are. We'll do our best. We will work hard, but there is a Lord of the harvest. And then 10, 1 to 7. The specific strategy for mission is that he calls the 12 to him. And we get a list of the names of the 12. They're not us. They are the 12. They are the eyewitnesses. They saw it all. They were there. One betrays him, of course. And he's replaced, but they saw it all. They, they are the eyewitness source of the New Testament. But here's the key now for the rest of this little narrative that maybe sets us up for the day. Let's move from Jesus' vision for mission, and let's move to his coaching plan, the key principles. As speakers and Bible teachers yourselves, you'll make your own alliterations and frameworks and headings and divisions of the text. I don't expect you to like mine. But let's see if the text can speak for itself here. In 5 to 8, he sends them out to a very narrow field. This is why it's a training exercise. He hasn't died. He hasn't risen. They don't quite get it. But he's going to give them a practice run. It's a friendly. It is. It's a friendly. Matthew 28, into the book of Acts, will give us how it works when the Spirit comes. When hearts are changed to know the risen Savior. But for now, he sends them out with the following instructions. Don't go amongst the Gentiles. It's a practice match. Don't enter the town of the Samaritans. You can't cope with that yet. You're not good enough for the first team yet. Go to the lost sheep of Israel because it's safer. It's an under-21s game. It's a, it's a safe event. No, that's what's happening here. But let me pick out for you some things that he gives us principles. And I wonder if they matter. Let, and my job is to throw them up in the air for you to think about as we frame the practical things of the day. My words are poor. Here's the first one. First of all, connect. Seven to ten. Archbishop Sentamu talked about David Shepherd. I hope you're the kind of woman or man in the room today. If people said to you, if you got old enough, um, how lovely to still see you trying to engage the world of sport as a Christian and witness in it. I hope you're the kind of person in the room, I suspect you are, if you've bothered to come, who would say, well, thank you, it's very kind of you, but I am that woman anyway. I'm not just there to try and somehow be a witness to anybody. I am that girl. I am that boy. I would be there anyway. It's my life. It's how God made me. I'm wired for it. But I am a Christian who's there. I'm not a Christian who goes in to do it. I am that woman. And I am a Christian in there because God has a creation mandate that I'm part of and as we're there now let's nail down a couple of principles David Shepherd connected beautifully because he held two things together verse 7 is the first part of the training exercise as you go proclaim this message the kingdom of heaven has come near we have the completed gospel we know the gospel message we have something to say if we don't say something of the kingdom of God, literally, verbally articulate, something of Christ, of his church, of the kingdom, if we don't speak, we can do a thousand strategies. The woman or man who engages with culture, who never makes it known that they belong to God through the completed work of Christ, has not set out who they are. We must say something of Christ. And you can waste years and years of your life thinking of strategies for ministry and never say in the most normal human way something of God. Which is crazy if you're thinking of how to do the work. But secondly, and they cannot be separated when you connect with people, look at 8 to 10. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey, extra shirt, sandals or staff for the worker is worthy of his keep. 
People debate to this day, and always will, I suppose, until the Lord returns, what we can do and what the apostles could do. Can we heal the sick? Can we raise the dead? That's been a forever ongoing debate in church history, and I surely will. Wherever you land on the side of things, let's be clear about this. No one ever healed a leper without touching a leper. No one ever touched a leper without hanging out with a leper. And no one hangs out with lepers, giving it the big thing with plenty of gold and silver and money and power and wealth. You have to be vulnerable. And that's why connecting with human beings is so fundamentally, it's so basic, it's axiomatic. You, on the one level, we must lead with saying something of Christ. I was talking to a chaplain just very recently, who, when he was introduced to the players at the club by the head coach, said, well, it's a delight to be here. I'm a Christian minister. Uh, I've trusted in Jesus Christ uh, as the pathway, the access to God who has brought me to who God is. I will not insist that you must believe that to have a relationship with me. I will serve this club on all levels that are needed. But if you do want to know about the path to God through Jesus Christ, I'm your man to have that conversation with. Now, is there a more elegant synopsis, in my own words, of what it is to connect as a human being? See, if you're a clergyman, it's relatively straightforward because you've got something to mark you out. Indeed, if you're invited into a club and you go in your normal garb, as it were, you're there as the chaplain. And yet there's something more, isn't there? There's something about crossing a pain line that articulates something of the kingdom of God that isn't just institutionalized and is always backed up by behavior that is basically vulnerable or humble. I'm not here to power you. I'm not here for a power relationship. I'm here to touch anybody who's as broken as me, harassed and helpless, a sheep without a shepherd. Gorgeous. And particularly in the world of sport, women and men like this in the world of sport, where the person and presence of Christ, not the idea of Christ, the reality of Christ by his spirit in us, means that they will see Christ even in our brokenness. So as we set the day up and as we debate and discuss strategies and progress we're making and things we'd like to learn, maybe we must hold on to this great training exercise that you must connect in word and deed and they must never be ripped. How absurd to rip them apart from each other. But a few more minutes. Look, look at verse 11. I've called this find. Now, this gets a bit more controversial. It's a short verse, and I'm going to skim on it because I think the debate might run. If God is the Lord of the harvest, and we must take responsibility for the world of sport, which is what we engage with today, listen to this. Whatever town or village you enter, club, park, recreation ground, golf course, wherever you enter. Search there for some worthy person, called by Luke, the person of peace, Shalom. And stay at their house until you leave. Look, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to jump straight to an application. Forgive me for the sloppy exegesis. Don't negotiate. Do not negotiate people out of the kingdom. When you go about your business, naming the kingdom of God, being the incarnate presence of Christ, look for somebody who is willing to engage with you because you're the person of Christ. Isn't it so easy to do this? Well, she'll never be interested. <laughs> Those four, no chance. Waste of time going there. Are you the Lord of the harvest? You see how the vision runs it? Time would stop me telling a long story. But I have a number of pals in the room who would know that a lovely boy called Guion Jenkins, when I was a 15-year-old boy, sat next to me on a school minibus. I was picked for my school cricket team. I thought I was picked because I was good. I was picked because I lived five minutes from school, and there was five minutes for some kid to get some whites to go to a game. So I jumped on the bus. He later told me that that was the first time he'd ever told anyone he was a Christian. And he told his mum and dad that night that he tried to tell a boy about being a Christian and failed badly. He sat next to me in a bus. I said, what did you do at the weekend? He said, I played cricket Saturday. I went to church Sunday. I said, why did you go to church? 
best player at everything at school. He said, I said, because your mother makes you go. And he said, no, because I follow Jesus. You know the punchline if you're an old pal. I said to myself, 45 miles to go on a trip. Vulnerable, a little bit nervous. You know, it was hardly Billy Graham because I followed Jesus, mumbled it out. This little young boy who was a sportsman who looked up to this man just looked at him and thought, you sat with me on the bus, you didn't sit with your pals, you looked after me, you go to church, what is that? You're a great sportsman. Six years that man kept in touch with me until I understood the kingdom of God had an application to me. Why negotiate away who you will say something of the kingdom to? Why is it your right or mine to negotiate away that conversation? Why do we say, they're not my kind of woman? Surely, no chance for her. We must look for people of peace to the gospel. And it comes from incarnational ministry with words and prayer. And the willingness to say, Lord, who? Who? Who will I engage this journey with? Look for the person of peace. You don't hear many talks about trusting the sovereignty of God in mission and being proactive and looking for somebody of shalom to the gospel through you. But don't confuse people liking you with this. There'd be people who want to argue. We know this, right? Who want to debate. I'd rather a debate than can't be bothered, wouldn't you? Show is gorgeous. 12 to 15. Nearly there. We go to 16. Connect through words and lifestyle. Look for where the Spirit is going before you. You don't know. You don't really know who a person of peace is. You have no idea. I wrote a list. Here's my negatives. There's always about a 15 to 1 ratio of negative experiences of this. Get in a conversation. What do you do at the weekend? Play cricket. What about you, Dana? What did you do? Ah, football Saturday, lost to Portsmouth. Went to church Sunday. Good talk on vulnerability. It was really interesting, actually. Have you ever been to church? Yes, have you ever been to church? Simon, Tommy, Andy, Rob, Steve, Eddie. I just randomly pick people from the last few weeks. All of those went, they didn't have to answer. Their eyes told me the answer. I asked a question. Said something of the kingdom, asked a question. I knew before they'd answered verbally what they thought. You know, don't you, in life? They just went, uh, nah. Or worse. And you say, oh, okay, good. Anyway, are you training tomorrow? You got a game Tuesday? Squash ladder, what number are you? Who you got this week? That's life, right? Normal. But hang on. Simon and Sean, in the last few weeks, went, ah, oh, funny that, because I used to, yeah, one of them went, when I was at uni, I... Uh, yeah, I went to church for a couple of years. I think, oh, where was it? Who do you go with? And you know when the conversation runs out, right? You know. And you move along. So I did the exact sums, actually. Uh, Eleven bad eyes. <laughs> Too good. Am I the Lord of the harvest? I am not. Am I privileged to be in this little sports world? I am. Is there a kingdom of God? There is. Am I going to negotiate for people? I must not, but everything in me wants to. Find. And when you find, show. Or, oh, as you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that town. Let's dive very quickly into this. To be invited into the home, you know the hermeneutic, to be invited into the home is intimate. You know when a girl or a bloke invite you into their life in this way? Yeah, I went to church. One of the boys said, yeah, funny, I, I went to church for two years when I was 15 and 16. My mate's family went to church regularly. I used to go around on Friday, and I started going to church with them for two years. He's 35, this boy. I said, oh, was it good? Oh, they were lovely. There was always people in their house. They were amazing people. They moved away. I said, you know, I've been to church since. No, not really, no. Ever thought about it? Well, I do sometimes, yeah. Do you fancy having a beer? And we'll pick up on it because we're about, about to watch a game or something. 
We said, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Then you think, great, revival's coming. <laughs> Took over a beer. I said to him, oh, beer, listen, we chat, chat, chat about experience. He's obviously warm. You don't know where it's going to go, you do, but you know him. It's incarnational. He said, listen, you know if I send you one of Jesus' stories, one of his stories, I send it to you. Next time we have a beer, read the story. Let's talk about the story. Should we? What do you mean? Just read the story. I'll send it to you, email you one story, three paragraphs, two minutes. We'll talk about the story. But I take them in my pocket to the pub where we'd normally be. Electric. It's electric. He says, oh, good story. That's Simon the Pharisee and the woman with the hair. What? Forgive me for the vernacular. I said, what do you make of the story? Forgive me. It's rude. It's the vernacular. He says, well, I, what do I make of the story? What a tosser that Simon is. <laughs> Sorry, that's rude. But it's the vernacular, right? I said, why is that? Very big time, isn't he? Giving it large in front of Jesus, making him look small, treating that woman like dirt. Now you're in a gospel story, right? Oh, my word. Stay at that house. That's what I reckon. Stay at that house. If that boy wants to talk, if it's five years, ten, stay at his house. It's intimate. He opens his heart to you. The girl opens her heart. You talk. But if they don't want to talk anymore, what happens? Tommy comes to a couple of these conversations. Sometimes you get two or three boys together to do it. Tommy, you know the famous text, struggling tonight, Dano. One hour to go. That means I'm not coming. Don't want to come, but can't tell you. You get two of those. You go, right, what's shaking the dust off your feet mean? Well, I'm not shaking the dust off my feet with my kids. That's for sure. Or many of my best friends. But you know what? You have to say to Tommy, Tommy, listen, twice now you've bombed out uh, having a little chat with the boys. Mate, you're a 40-year-old man. You don't have to come. I'd hate it if you came to those kind of discussions just to keep me sweet because you're embarrassed. I would hate it. Don't come, mate, if you don't want to come. And he says, yo, thanks, man. I don't want to come. I said, I said hey, Tom, listen, just one more thing. The sports quiz we do, which we'll show you later, do you still want to come? To that? Oh, yeah, I'll come to that. All right, mate. But listen, can I just say one more thing? Verse 15. It'll be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment for that man, for that time. Tommy, we may never talk about this again. You know, we've done three talks from Luke's account of the life of Jesus together and chatted with two or three of the boys. You will meet him. You're, you're a grown bloke, so you run your own life, but you'll have to meet him sometime. You must have that in your radar somehow. Right? Okay, good. Anyway, you played up front today. I'm left side. <laughs> ah, but isn't that it, though? Isn't that it? Isn't that the point? Everybody's different. Remember, this is a practice match he sends them on. It's principles. It's not tactics. All personality is different. All sport is different. All relational behaviors are different. But, but there are principles here. Words, incarnation, intimacy. Word of God doing God's work in the home. Treating people as adults, respectful. Not negotiating for people, but being respectful to them. And finally, verse 16, equip which runs through the whole of chapter 10. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to local councils and flogged in synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. Now here comes the business. If a woman looks at the stories of Jesus in Luke or Mark with you, because you have said something of the kingdom, you're incarnational, you're in that sports world, it's who you are. You find somebody of shalom when they answer a question, you walk with them, you're in the home, and let's say they actually work out that they must trust Christ. I can think of a boy now with that story of Simon the Pharisee and the woman, the three or four boys in the room, Luke 7, said, good, Trev, what do you make of this story then at the end? 45 minutes over a beer. What do you make of this story? If I was a Christian, I'd be better than that Simon. What an idiot. What do you make of it, Andy? Eh. I can see why he did it. He's putting the bloke in his place. He's putting Jesus in his place. Mark, your shout, your last shout. What do you make of the story now we've had it, looked at it over a beer? Oh, boys, you're going to kill me for this. Why? I'm a bit like the woman. Whee! <laughs> 
I'm a bit like a woman. What do you mean you're a bit like a woman? I feel a bit like her. What have I just heard? Outrageous grace. I've just heard outrageous grace. Everybody does works, right? And then the Spirit's gone, you feel like a woman. My duty to Mark is to get him into a local church, to take him to church, to look at the Bible with him, to keep him in his world of sport, and to say to him, if you follow Christ, the way in is the way on, Mark. Mark, disciples of Jesus, Matthew 28. They connect, they find, they show, and they equip the next generation. Ladies and gentlemen, our job today is to reflect, not on the principal level now, which sets the context for us, but on the granular level of my work in Cambridge and your work in Manchester and so on, is to do this. How will we do discipleship in the world of sport? It is worth spending a day to think about because there are 10 million people involved in sport. There are 150,000 clubs. It is a vast mission field. But here's my great joy. There is a Lord of the harvest and he sends us, little leaderless group without Christ. Oh, shall I pray for help? And we'll crack on with the day. Heavenly Father, please help us to rejoice in the grace of salvation in the joy of your great love for us, in our trust in your great kingdom's plan. And may every one of us walk out of here today with at least one thing where we can rejoice at the prospects and opportunities open to us in our parish, club, team, diocese, that we think, that's good. I can run with that. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.